Okay. Uh, so we'll uh, go on with the round table. I'd like to salute here uh, our uh, composers, uh, Livia Teodorescu Ciocanea from Romania, Sven Helbig from Germany, François Nicolas from France, Mladen Tarbuk from Croatia, uh, Rolf Martinson from Sweden, and uh, the conductor uh, Ramon Gamba from UK, which, who will moderate this uh, session, the last session of the round table. Allow me to summarize some ideas which were presented uh, here in the frame of the uh, round table regarding the proposed main topic, topic, balance and excess. From the beginning, uh, we re remarked the different approaches one can have in front of this polarity. First, one cannot imagine the balance without the concept of contrast. In order to have balance, we have to have contrast. Some of the speakers emphasized the fact that balance and excess are concepts which depend upon the context. It is very important, the musical context, but also cultural, historic, and geographical context. What is excess for someone could be balance for another and vice versa. More one can talk about balance and excess from different perspectives. Form, structure, virtuosity, orchestration, length, volume. There is a joke about being a conductor, Karan used to say. For being a conductor, Karan said, one needs to know three things, th uh, six things. Too soon, too late, too loud, too soft, too fast, too slow. It looks to me these are indications in order to keep the balance of the piece. Uh, Magnus Lindbergh said, excess is everything which begins with very. Another idea sprang in a discussion about the excess of balance, which brings us to the discussion about being bored. And here, Detlef Glanert had an in interesting idea about researching the phenomenon of boredom. Cornel Serrano spoke about the balanced excess, a sort of a well-tempered excess. He has two opposite, opposite attitudes toward composition, balance and excess, could be easily confounded with moderation and radicalism, or even worse, tradition and avant-garde. Other themes which occurred in the discussions until now were about how facing uh, the block phenomenon, the st stuck, about the pre-compositional pre process, about finding the ending of a piece, about the control of the form, about the importance of defining structure and form, about the choices, but also about some examples from the music history. Last but not least, reconnecting with the audience was one of the most important themes which occurred yesterday. So enjoy the, today's session, and Rumon Gamba, you have the floor. We, we're all right without microphones? I am, because you can hear me, I know. <laughs> I'm a conductor. They need it for the... the... Okay, so I won't shout at you. Um, since we've already had the introductions of, of, the, of, the, of our panel today, perhaps we, we won't need to go around again and introduce ourselves, but I might just ask for uh, a little short statement from each of you, maybe how we're going to approach this topic. Dan has already covered a lot of the things you've talked about. I also was interested in not only balance an excess in the composition itself, but balance and excess in the process when a composer is on their own, in their hut or wherever they are, how uh, you balance actually writing and how, 
how much material we are, we are dealing with. Is there an excess of material or is there um, a, a paucity of material? How, how we balance the schedule, how we uh, manage excess and how we manage our expectations and the road actually physically composing. So perhaps rather than also the general topics of balance and excess, we can talk about some specifics. Uh, I know that, Francois, you had already something, uh, perhaps you'd like to kick us off with um, some thoughts on balance uh, and excess in composition. I'm going to get, oh, there's loads of microphones here, so please, uh, welcome. Yeah, okay, if you want, but, <laughs> okay. Um, for me, uh, the composition is a kind of uh, balance between three kinds of excesses, you see. Uh, because for me, uh, what structures the music is three kinds of excesses. The first one is perhaps we call it uh, expressivity excess. It's the idea, it's more important for the player, you see, that when you are playing something, you have to, to give the impression to the listener that there is many things to, to, to say, two things to say, and so you have a kind of expressivity of your playing to give this feeling to the listener. You, if you play a pa da la 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 la, there, there is more than the, the the notes that you are playing. So for me, the first thing is very important in music is the, the expressivity in this sense. You see. Um, it's a problem, more the problem of the player, instrumentist, than of the composer, of course. It, it is the first one. I call it uh, the, the excess of expressivity. There is a second one, which is uh, between writings and what you perceive. You see, there is in music, I think, an excess of what you write on what it's possible to perceive. It's not a problem of complexity in writing. It's uh, specific to the structure of the music. Um, so when you perceive a, a score, played of course by uh, everyone, it's not exactly the same thing that when you write, you read the, the, the score, because the structure of the writing, this music, is not exactly the same as the structure of musical perception, you see. So there is a kind of excess of what is in the score on what you, you are able to perceive by he hearing. So uh, I name it, this kind of excess, discursivity excess. And it's an excess which concerns the composer, or the writer, you see, more than the interpret. And there is a third excess, in the other sense, it's an excess of perception, this time of perception on what you write. Uh, I call it harmonicity, because it's a, the, um, the capacity of here to do, to make one with some several notes. For example, if you write on your score uh, a chord of C, ma C major, you put three Three pitches, C, E, G. So you write on your scores three pitches. But you don't write, of course, on your score uh, C major. But if it is well done, well played, for the hear, the hear does not hear three, three uh, pitches. They hear one chord. So it's a capacity of the hear to unify the the plural of the pictures to make one and this kind of one is not written on the score. Uh, of course in, uh, in notation of jazz for example you don't do that today yeah, you, you write C major you, you, but in uh, the kind of music that I write you, you don't do that. So there is an excess of perception on the writings because there is a capacity of the perception that you have not in the writings. You don't see it exactly in the writing. So, I uh, resume, you have an, an excess of uh, expressivity for the player. There is an excess of, uh, I said, discursivity, musical discursivity in the, in the score by the writer. And you have an excess of harmonicity of 
capacity, capability to, to, to come for one some kind of plural in the scores. Uh, and it's an excess on the side of uh, who, the, the people who are hearing the piece. And for me, the musicality, or the try to do music, is try to balance between these three kinds of excess, you see. Uh, of course, the difficult problem is what exactly they mean by balance here, but uh, it's, uh, for me, the major problem when I hear a piece, I try to hear where is expressivity, where is discursivity, where is harmonicity, and how oh, there is a combination between, between these three kinds of excess, a kind of balance of the composer or the piece balance between these three kinds of excess in a piece. Uh, okay. Thank you. That's, that, that's, that's very interesting. Um, I'm going to pick you up straight away and maybe chuck it to someone else. Um, is, is there such a thing as being an excess of expressivity? We all want music to be expressive. I, as the conductor, do. I'm asking my players always to find the expression. But is there such thing as a phrase being played too expressively? Should we cool it? Uh, Sven, maybe I'm going to jump straight in to you um, about uh, how, if you have any thoughts about being too expressive, um, maybe sometimes we need to play a little bit more, I don't know. Yeah, this is a good question for me, probably goes back to our conversations we had the last days, because I think expression is also a thing, that to define it, you have to see in what, what type of culture is your music uh, listened to. Like when my mother comes for the coffee visiting me and I played John Coltrane Ballads, which is a nice album and it calms me down and it's wonderful and I love this one. My mother could not even hold her uh, coffee uh, cup, you know, because it's driving her totally nervous. It's the pure expression. Elvin Jones on drums, yeah, Jim Garrison on piano, all those crazy chords and she goes crazy and wild and she... She likes music and, and art, but this is something that is way too expressive. In the world where I live in, I always see the cultural context, and we have a cultural problem at the moment, since in the Western world, uh, our, our folk culture is shrinking. So nobody's singing anymore for the children, nobody is dancing, we're losing body control and all this stuff. And... Um, Expression needs uh, training to go to the higher expression, uh, com expressive uh, com complexity. Also the soft ones. I, I'm not just saying it has to be loud, like the, the ballads um, album I mentioned by John Coltrane. But it's in the chords, it's in the, in the syncopation somehow, it, it's in the lines that uh, John Coltrane plays. And all this needs training. You cannot go in and, and, and get this. Then, if if you haven't heard um, a C major chord yeah, with with the with the with the seventh, this might be way too expressive for you and even sound wrong. So I look: where do I play it? What is what is my audience? And where are my my limits? Like like in other genres of um, of art, like uh, in the movies. Okay, if you are a director and you sit in the editing room. And how expressive you ever are and how great you are, like uh, Tarkovsky or, or Stanley Kubrick, you sit down and your major question is, do the people get it? Will they get it? This is the major question. And if it's too expressive and the story gets lost, then it, it doesn't make any sense. So they have to keep in mind where will this movie be seen and how will the people, fo can they still follow me? And this is a, a problem that when you, you know out there are not, all of you are not Stanley Kubricks or Tarkovskys. So I have to somehow step down and see where is this, in, in what field of culture will this be seen and where is the limit of the, pe of the people that will come. So I'm that way of, of, a, of an artist. And so I try to balance this out. When I wrote this piece that we played in the, in the concert, the Pocket Symphonies, I went back, back to my parents, to my mother, that doesn't like John Coltrane. 
and I, I locked myself in the attic. And this was always my reference point because I was, I had a similar story that has been told today by, um, by Rolf already changed my, changing my way of composition. So I went back there. My question was always in the attic when my mother asked, what are you doing up there? Because of course I did not have an instrument. It was just paper and pen, pencil. And I did not want to go down from the attic and say, I compose, but it's not for you. So my, she was kind of my reference point, and I always tried to write for her, but go as expressive as she might follow. And I, I could even, while writing, feel her, how she would sit there and say, oh, it's the, it's the, the climax, it's the drama point, I hope it's over soon. So and I was writing for her and for my family and for my friends. And this is um, expression is always def defined by cultural expectations. That's very interesting. So your balance and your balance of excess comes from specific situations and specific culture. I wonder, Livia, if, if you're given completely free reign and you're composing in your own vacuum and you're not considering outside influence, I mean, how do you handle excess or balance do you have an excess of i mean i'm not a composer but i always imagine that i would have a, a a vast excess of ideas in my head and how how are we dealing with that because surely at some point you have to narrow it down to something specific i would have way too much going on um if uh, we think of artists i think uh, artists should not be discouraged to be excessive in many ways and uh, to in order uh, to uh, have our works uh, be catchy to the public to receive it I think uh, some excessive uh, gestures should be it, it, it is an exceptional an ex exceptional state of mind to, to perform or to to compose, so something hyper is there, hypersensitivity. But I would like to, to uh, solve in my way uh, <laughs> the topic uh, uh, that is not so, uh, so easy, uh, excess and balance. So I, I thought of um, two couples of opposites. Um, therefore, uh, balance and imbalance and uh, excess and shortage. So I think if consistent and uh, intended excess uh, in, in composition in a, uh, could, uh, could uh, not destroy the balance of the, of the piece. Uh, but uh, unintended and uh, uh, inconsistently use of uh, excess uh, could <laughs> destroy the, the balance. This is uh, not the case uh, for architecture, for example. If you, uh, composition is true for architectural literature, and in, uh, composition means uh, order, unity. And uh, in classical thinking, any disturbance of uh, of an element of composition will uh, result in an imbalanced uh, piece of, of uh, work. But in architecture, <laughs> an uh, imbalanced uh, structure will, will, will result in a collapse of the building. But in music, it's not the same. So uh, I, uh, I, I'm not saying that uh, we should not uh, use excess or shortage. Uh, even I, I, um, I think uh, excess led over the time to uh, changing of aesthetics. Think of uh, chromaticism, excess of chromaticism. Think of excess of uh, density. Oh, we, we have now sonic mass. Think of uh, excess of, I don't know, ornaments or, or uh, or, or um, effects, tumbral effects. Uh, if not skillfully used, this will destroy the piece. But if intended and uh, very 
well conducted, uh, this will result in a put, result in a masterpiece. Uh, it is said that uh, um, less is more, <laughs> but uh, for me, <laughs> for me, I prefer more. I prefer more in uh, conveying my intentions in music. And talking about this, and, and this is the structural level I talked about. But I think we talk about excess or, or reserve uh, in, in the attitude of, uh, in the attitude towards music. Uh, the word emotion. The attitude toward emotion in music. Uh, we could be uh, ex ex excessively emotionally or reserved. Or the history of music proved that uh, excess of romanticism were uh, uh, denied and then we have we had the reserved or even pure music. So the attitude toward emotion. And this is a very, very mm, fragile uh, uh, <coughs> problem in music and uh, performing I think uh, uh, it depends you talked about um, expressivity it, as, and as, a, as a conductor you want it up to the, <laughs> the end uh, expressivity it, it has to be to, it has um, to do with the truth of music with the truth and people know the truth I think even non-educated, and it is, if it's excessive or if it's less, then it will uh, destroy the <laughs> balance. Yeah, and I think you're right. It's, it, it need, expressivity can only, can only come from extreme honesty. On, the truth know, of music within, and yeah. be connected with the truth of the style of the, of the music. And this is, I think, universally, uh, you can't teach truth in music. <laughs> it was interesting, the idea of um, excess too much, trying to compress excess to get where we want rather than trying to explode something not very much. It's better to have too much and try and fit it in. If, in like you say, this, um, moving from the, you know, the late romantic period, there was excess and that allowed uh, then it to become back in again and kept. It's better to try and come too much and then come back than to try and get towards that boundary. It's yeah. never going to happen. You're never going to get, you're going to always put too much stress yeah. on this situation. I wonder, Madam, do you have any thoughts about um, balance and excess well, in this I respect? I'd like to continue because I think uh, we are talking always, uh, thank you very much, uh, but I think we can hear it. Uh-huh. Uh, um, I think the most important thing uh, uh, in, in this discussion is temporal aspect. We must think about time aspect because we can't judge uh, really absolutely uh, what is excess and what is balance. Balance and the excess will be established through the process of listening. And uh, therefore it is practically impossible to define it absolutely. So what I mean, for instance, as, as you really pointed out very nice, nicely, uh, I can start composition with one very complicated structural process, which is probably developing, I don't know, through three minutes or four minutes, and it will be always more complicated, complicated and more complicated. And then uh, through this excess, I will finally expect some dissolution, some solution, something that will come out of this mess. Of course, a uh, radical solution will be something very simple, maybe one tone, maybe just break. Uh, so there are a lot of means that we are really uh, uh, taking in account in the music. And uh, in such situation, obviously, we can say the balance is achieved through nothing, through the break, through the pause. So um, I think that's the way how we composers uh, are always thinking. And I think this psychological aspect of listening or temporal aspect is also important uh, 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 to be taken in account when we are composing. So we are not making the point with architecture was very good. Uh, we are doing uh, 
in a way architecture, but there is just one rule different. Uh, of course, we know that the gravitation architecture is extremely important. If you are making some excesses, <laughs> then if it's not stable, we, you will have uh, everything collapsed. But we can have also collapse in the music, I would say. I wouldn't deny it. Uh, it is, if we are not taking uh, time in the account. So if uh, I am making, for instance, uh, less elements in longer period of time, or if I'm not developing my idea properly, then we are coming to this idea of boredom. I think boredom is always achieved through this lack of interest in the time aspect of composition. And uh, being professor also, uh, I can say from my experience, I don't know if colleagues will also agree, uh, there is never enough said and stressed to the students about this time aspect of composition. You should, through all five years, always <laughs> repeat the same sentence, which is so important. Uh, and I would say, in this sense, less is more. So then better to say, uh, think in the shorter period, but of course, with musical means, a really adequate, appropriate to this time. And we should always judge and think about f time frame and the structure which is put into it. I think that's probably, uh, when we are talking about uh, extreme and uh, balance, I would say through extremes we will come in balance, but through time, maybe for beginning. I, th I think Rolf was probably going to agree with some of that, judging from your um, little uh, Ars Poetica earlier. Um, you yes, were impressing yes. very much the same ideas. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I wouldn't be talking that much, but, um, and also about things like this. But I have a few statements here. I don't feel that um, balance and excess are opposites to each other. They're rather complementary for me. And... Um, Excess, of course, I agree to what you say, but for me, excess could be anything which is too much. And I like that perspective very much when I'm composing, because there I find new ideas when I get stuck. And I wrote down here two sentences. Excess in music is necessary, uh, necessary to be able to exceed the predictable musical limits. And balance in music is necessary to prepare for the excess being a musical surprise. And um, if I think of balance, it's something polite for me. And excess is unpolite, and I like that. <laughs> but balance can be uh, exciting as well. Uh, I of haven't course. done it for a long time, but walking on a, a tightrope, in fact I've never done it, let's be honest, <laughs> but uh, you have to have great balance to walk along a tightrope and I think there's some risk in there uh, also. Um, is, is, there a, is there a point at which excess means absolute overload uh, so that there's so much excess something can be broken? Uh, firstly, I don't um, see excess as an extreme. I see a continuum axis uh, uh, excess shortage or balance imbalance. And I think manipulating excesses uh, on this balance imbalance axis is one of the main secrets in our artistry. And, uh, uh, and uh, yes, sometimes could be uh, um, a too much uh, uh, load of information. This is bad, I think, on, t on, the, on the timing. When uh, too much well, um, information, the, the uh, ear can't, uh, uh, the oral conscience can't, can't um, detect the details. But maybe this is intended, as in our, our days, uh, the crowded uh, structures, the uh, textures, uh, um, uh, uh, spectral things, many spectral uh, um, music, but I'm thinking of spectral music that tries, try to, um, 
to re reconfigure a, sp a specific timbre in orchestra. In orchestra. Yeah. Uh, I mean to, uh, divide, to put the elements of a timbre, the harmonics, uh, and to orchestrate them on, on, the, on the orchestra. So it will, it will uh, result in a very uh, massive uh, uh, orchestration page, orchestral page of so music. So this could, could be um, uh, too much, but uh, it, it depends on the aesthetics and, and on, on the consistency. And so, I mean, as, as composer, one has to be self-regulator. You have to have your own balance, your own sense of balance, what is too much, what is too little. Uh, Francois, how about how are you approaching balance rather than excess? How do you balance your compositions? Uh, in uh, maybe for that, oh, thank you. Uh, I agree with the, the point that balance and excess are not opposite, but for a precise reason for me, that balance and excess are not exactly a question of quantity, you see. So I don't agree that the idea of excess is too much or that balance is a problem of moderate, you see. Because if, it's, it, if it is only a problem of quantity, of course, you say excess, I go that, and balance, I go on the other side. I, I, I think it's not very interesting to think the, the, the problem in this kind of uh, opposition. So for me, the problem of excess is a problem of quality, you see, it's not a problem of quantity. Of course, you are speaking there, it's possible to have an excess or an excess. In philosophy, we, we name that the sublime. Kant, Kant uh, names that the, the, the sublime. Uh, the beauty is a question of excess, and the excess of excess is a question of sublime. But of course, sublime is not a quantity, more quantity of beauty, you see. You, it's impossible to. So, it's why the first excess is, for me, always excess of something over another thing. It's not just a question of quantity. So I try to explain for me, for example, the excess of the writings or the listening or the inverse or something like that. But it's not exactly, it's, it's because there is two quality different, you see, we have to, to be together. So the balance for me is not to go on the other side of the excess as if you want, if you think that like a problem of quantities, but it's a balance between excess, you see? And so, of course, we have a different way of speaking of that. I don't say that my, my point of view is a good one, and, uh, but, but uh, uh, so just say that. It's not a problem of quantities for me. Of course, there is or, or the problem of quantity on some point, if you are playing too loud or too, or too loud, but excess is not exactly the problem of two, like a quantity problem for me. Completely uh, understand. And um, oh, likewise, balance is n not a question of overcompensating. That's the other, other, other trick you could, you could fall into by accident. It's not overcompensating. There's very fine ad adjustments. Sven, do you have anything uh, on, on this in particular, Proto and Bladon, maybe? Yeah, like you said in philosophy, so modern philosophy proves that all the dualisms do not really exist. It's just two different forms or two different, um, it's positive, negative uh, uh, forms of the, of the same thing. And of course, the balance can be the more ex excessive part and the, the, the most expressive, excessive uh, moment. And if it goes forever, like in other kinds of music, in electronic music, we have this wide field of ambient music, for example, and harsh noise music, white noise music, where people go on stage and for two hours turn the volume up and uh, make a lot of noise and it's it uh, after a while it gets really yeah, it's uh, it's not uh, excessive anymore in in no way the ex the the excessive moment is where before it starts and and after so it, it, so it's totally different concepts also the, the the concept of time is also the again the cultural context in the in the wide field of the music of ambient or, or drone music, people get used to have longer periods of time. They listen for like one hour to something that changes very slowly since, uh, since Lamont Young, you know, 
is the um, and Terry Riley's in C, we get used to very long periods and people listen, they sit in the cross, in the stereo cross and wait for the slightest difference that might appear in uh, Abul Mogad's uh, word or even Brian Eno has fantastic music. Also in the band world, like the next, they improvise for like one hour and fantastic albums and you wait and after 20 minutes the first change is coming. And if you, if you are in this mood, okay, then the then is, you have totally different parameters for balance and excess and what it is and in what time. So that's, that's why, again, it's the cultural context where you put this. And also, I see the balance and uh, excess much more in my communication with people that listen. It's a give and take and a communication. Because I feel when I'm on stage, how long can I hold this? I, and it's every day it's different. Sometimes I feel, okay, we have to go on with the piece, and now today I feel, oh, I can hold this. It still has tension, it has potential. Still, 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 now go on. And this is different, and it, it changes with the weather, the pressure of the air, and with whatever, and where you are. In Romania, people might be a bit, bit faster than <laughs> somewhere else. In Sweden, you said you are, you are so slow up there. And uh, th so it's... It's always context. We have this since like 50 years in the art. We have this this word of context. People taking a, a closet and putting it on the wall, and it's art because it works in the context. But you would not go on the restroom and see, oh my God, it's an art gallery. <laughs> so and the, and the context became such a strong aspect of art. It's not anymore like in the Michelangelo world. The context was just in the picture, just in the artwork. So. Today, it's the context. It's even the context be between all the composers. We can say, you go wild and I go balanced. And we together make this uh, um, be the, the ex, uh, excess and balance um, um, phenomenon that, we, that you approach. And then you put your playlist on Spotify and put a piece of him and then, uh, then mine and then you get balanced. You know? Why? Uh, it's not anymore that in every single piece you have to get to this point. We are in the context world. In the, the whole um, art world is uh, dominated by this. Maybe we, one day we get back again and have the perfect artwork that, that um, works always like it was in the, um, in the 18th, 19th century. And it started somewhere in the 50s where then all of a sudden context was, yeah, like I said, dominating and you had those guys making this and they make this and together this was all you all you uh, might need for your to satisfy your soul and your artistic needs context Mladen, how how feel you about this i'm very glad that we switched to this theme because it's really the part of of the uh, problem uh, uh, thinking of excess and the balance i think the context uh, is as swen pointed out is probably the the main point where we can say uh, that was the art before and the art after in uh, inventing the context or let us say modern or pre-modern uh, art uh, of course context was always pre present but uh, i think the um, composers on let us say generally artists were not uh, so aware or did not calculate on, on, on the context. Uh, the problem, or I would say it could be also a spoiled moment, uh, is when the, the, the artist is composing uh, uh, his uh, work, uh, knowing and pointing precisely on certain point uh, with his work. And of course this point is how to uh, get along with the audience. Uh, because this audience is expect uh, is is his his context and he's uh, very very aware of the fact that he's writing for such audience for the people who are just expecting this of him. Um, but as I said, uh, uh, it was uh, do not do not blame only uh, uh, artists today. It was the same thing before. I mean, there were uh, letters uh, written by Haydn where he is really also stating how proud he is that he really uh, uh, come along with the taste of the listeners, of the bourgeois listeners of the end, of the, at the ending of 18th century. So it was not better than today. Uh, 
So, so probably uh, uh, it is more theoretical uh, way how to divide history in pre-modern and modern time. Um, but still, I think that the context uh, will not help in a way how to uh, um, achieve effect of boredom or to stay active. Uh, for sure, uh, we are still the same listeners. Uh, I would say proportion can, proportions can be same. So it means uh, if I'm uh, writing or if I'm composing the work, which is really miniature, uh, then probably I have to invent my material in such a way, or I should take in consideration only that material that will suit to the miniature. So from the very beginning, I must know it will be the piece of, I don't know, three minutes, four minutes, five minutes. Huh? And if I am thinking about something of six hours, uh, which is also possible, I think the maximum was, uh, uh, Cage was 70, 70 years. How long was Cage piece for organs? Something, something like that. So you can even write music that will last longer than a human life. Uh, why not? It's possible. But then, of course, uh, you must also think about uh, uh, material that will suit to this uh, uh, concept. And of course, then you will also um, use and compose with this material in that way. So you will think about time expectations. Um, it's very obvious point uh, uh, in in the. Uh, concept of Wagner op dramas. For instance, it's a very good historical example of this switch. So we can really uh, uh, say that uh, until Wagner, there was one concept of phrase of uh, very anthropomorph uh, music that was really uh, um, connected with our brain, with our breath, with our uh, heart beating. And since Wagner, there is another concept that was always developing in this, let's say, more Indian way. I'm just joking, of course, it was not just Indian, but for sure for Wagner it came through, through this uh, point. And uh, you can really see that his material, you can really, uh, really uh, uh, state this, that his material is totally different than the material of previous com composers, and it's only because of the concept of longer, longer time, so so-called monumentalization of the music, but it's, I think, wrong word. It's not about making monument. It's more about making uh, other measures of time and, of course, uh, the, the, the music that will then suit to this uh, new concept. Um, well, but uh, maybe uh, we are also coming uh, to another interesting point, uh, which is a uh, problem of defining style of music today. Uh, we are longing for uh, uh, clear style or prevalent style since probably 1910. But uh, obviously there is still <laughs> no style appearing and we have always more concepts uh, and uh, more ways how to compose. And still, of course, uh, uh, which would be for one composer uh, probably balanced, well-balanced, and interesting for another composer in his uh, way of thinking, it would be really just excess. Uh, and I must say, I did not see uh, the development of this moment in such, uh, uh, under such light that we will come back to the concept of unique style or something like that. I think even more uh, the way of uh, uh, development of cultural and economic and political development of the humanity will tend to go even to atomization, which is obviously a paradox, but not such paradox. We are today 8 billion people uh, in the world, so 8 billion universe, and it's quite, it will be always more difficult to, uh, um, to find uh, the audience for every one of these 8 billion composers. Do you have something to add, mm. Rolf? There? Just a small thing. You said uh, too much excess. I don't think you can express it like that because there are not too much express, some uh, excess. Some um, examples uh, are Riley, Cage, Glass, Feldman, Adams, Pert. They're really excess in silence or repeating. 
And uh, let's say if we have had um, Mr. Strawinski here talking about his right of spring, uh, we all know about rhythm, polyrhythm, meter, time signatures, and orchestration. And um, think of that we have been teachers to him and said, come on, Igor, this is too much. Can't you see that? Too much excess in all those parameters. But now we know better. It's also a way to build a new style, a new direction. It's, it's, this is exactly what I pointed before. If consistently, excess uh, could lead to a very good uh, result it, it, and, could, and could result in new, in new aesthetics. Like, for example, minimalism we were talking about is repetitive minimalism is uh, an example of consistently use of ex ex excess. What is excess? Repetition. In excess. Yeah. So this is an example how, if consistently, it could be um, a masterpiece or a new perspective on syntax or style. Yeah. This is what I tried to say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That's, a, that's really clarified and sort of condensed yeah. the argument. Is it? I, I would just wonder, before we move on to some slightly more um, Pragmatic questions. If anyone has anything else to add, I think we've come in a quite a quite a nice uh, conclusion to that little area. If anyone has anything else to add, I think we've discussed balance and excess, two uh, possibly horrible words. We have to put words on these things, but um, you know, we need to find uh, other ways of I expressing. I'm going to go around now because I know that a lot of you are interested in specifically um, the composer in all these human beings. Um, and I might just ask a couple of quick questions so we can understand how these composers deal with their balances and their excesses and their, their, their daily routines maybe even like that. Livia, um, we've been talking about context a lot and, and taking yourself um, perhaps away from context. You're composing in your room yeah. uh, for anything in particular, maybe nothing. H how are you going about your business in on your own uh, can you compose anywhere does it have to be a specific place uh, a specific um, luxury or <laughs> opposite um, how are you functioning day to day as a composer I'm very modest I can uh, compose uh, anywhere but um, sometimes I need uh, sometimes I need um, um, piano Sometimes uh, I need only the desk and my uh, pencil, uh, sometimes directly on the computer. Um, but um, about the context, I, I thought you, you meant um, cultural context or only environment. No, 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 <laughs> cultural context. Cultural I mean, context. I, 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 we keep saying cultural context is, you know, such yes, a big thing. Many, 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 la many layers. layers yes. So uh, about the cultural context, yes, I am aware of being uh, uh, influenced and uh, especially not by certain uh, composer but or some, <laughs> some uh, techniques, but uh, I'm influenced uh, by some ethos, and I think culture, different cultures have uh, different ethos, of course. <laughs> so, uh, in my uh, case, I think um, uh, I can't escape the the Romanian, the East European uh, flavor, let's say, or uh, uh, ethos. But also, I can. Um, uh, perceive some composers' ethos. For example, um, Gubai Dolina, which, um, who I uh, like so much, or uh, from different cultures, you know, so I can uh, maybe I, uh, I embrace uh, some uh, others' uh, ethos. Francois, do you feel the same way? Do you have this same reaction when you're Composing? Do you, do you have a context? It's very different, but uh, it's so specific that uh, I'm not sure that it's very interesting. You <laughs> see, but uh, uh, because I compose, I compose not uh, every day. You see, it's by period. You see, I, I do a lot of things in life, so uh, not only composing. So, uh, 
but I am always thinking to, to what I have to compose, something like that, you see, but uh, when I compose, it's very uh, quickly. So I need a kind of excess, perhaps, for compose, you see, the, the sensation of uh, urgence, urgency, or something like that, uh, but uh, not, uh, not regular, not balanced, not... Uh, I am an excessive man, or, or <laughs> in a, uh, I'm interested, um, uh, you're saying you do a lot of things. Mladan, you do a lot of things. Um, you're conducting, teaching, w w playing. How, do you, how on earth do you Too many things. have enough time for composition? Uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, well, uh, the first thing is the only way how to survive. That's, I think, common to all composers. I mean, it's very difficult to live only of, of composition. You must really do a lot of things. Then also with age, uh, you have also... Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I would say also urge to also transmit some of your knowledge to younger people. It's also very important because it's also the way how to prove your ideas, I would say. It's not, uh, when I say teach, I do not think in just one way process, but in both ways. I learned so much of, from my students, probably more than they learned from me. Uh, and then uh, if you are just asking me about the process of composing, it was always... Uh, quite long period uh, working in, in mind, by in, in head, and uh, I would say short period by writing n notes or score or concept, wh whatever it was. But uh, I must say that sometimes I'm cooking things even a year or two years, and then the, this process of composition uh, can be really, maybe, maybe, I just wrote, now wrote symphony in 40 days, so... I can I can then finish the work technically uh, quickly, but it was interesting. There are two compositions in my uh, opus <laughs> that were uh, that were composing through the longer period of time, and I don't know why. I'm quite curious if anybody of of you had si same experience. I started one chamber work in uh, 1996, and it was typical. I was not uh, uh, finishing on time. And then I tried two times to return, and I was not happy. And then now, in 2013, I finished the work, and it was quite long. It, it is about 50 mu minutes of, uh, for, for qu string quartet, marimba, and piano. So quite long, many notes also to, to write. And there is another uh, composition written for organ and uh, uh, percussion uh, about ap Apocalypse. But I'm still, I did not finish it, so there will be no apocalypse, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> it was interesting what you were saying about you um, pick, learning from your students. Uh, Rolf, you, you teach a lot. When you've been having a good teaching session day and um, you go to compose, do you find that something you've taken from the teaching is affecting your composition? Um, yes. lessons from the day or, or one thing? Sometimes. Um, as a teacher you are forced to give good answers and uh, also to dive into the problems in another score than your own. And um, I, of course I prepare by thinking of music and solutions and so, but also in the situation with the student. I'm inspired when I'm teaching and this also gives me a lot of ideas of how to solve it. And again, like I show my parameters, variation, combinations, and all that, it's a part of my teaching. Uh, I have two more things to say to the students. Uh, be honest to yourself. Don't accept to be pushed the way you write music. This is obvious, but difficult. Second thing is pay attention to instrumentation as a rare parameter not able to measure that simple as melody, harmony, and rhythm requires a sensitive ear. Sven, you um, are a very, very busy man working on lots of different projects. Tell me, do you work on one thing at a time, or are you very good at juggling uh, in the composition process? Can, does it have to be just one composition you are obsessed with, or can you work on two, three, or four different things uh, on different days? Yeah, I always compose, it's every day. I also use the pencil and the paper. And for me, the most driving mechanic of what I do is 
um, coming from the popular world, so I always write a new album. I think in albums and releases. I write a new album, releases, go on tour, have fans that like to listen to my music, I meet them, and then write the next album, release it, go on tour, have some fans, talk with them. They are um, disappointed because this time is choir. Why is it not orchestra that it was before? So I, I live in a, in a different way. So I like to hang out, see many different types of concerts. When I, I'm in Berlin, I go see from Ben Frost, Felicia Atkinson is coming, but also Gardner did the Mon uh, Monteverdi three, op uh, three operas in a row. Fantastic to see him, the master of that uh, genre. And I mix it up every day, and you can do this in Berlin pretty easily. And I go and, and, and go to, to all kinds of electronic music, also popular music. I, go, I also produce a lot of hip hop. I work with uh, Rammstein as the German rock band. I did uh, Snoop Dogg, I did German acts. And so I'm, I, I live, my, uh, you know, I hang out in a bar and then I meet friends and it's like a community and we all, some of them are artists, some, some of them not, but I have like a quiet communication with them. I always think of them when I do something and this drives me, but it's, it always leads into an album. Like when you are a painter, then it leads into your next exhibition and then you have the catalog. You know, which is in my world is the catalog is the the actual catalog is the is the album, and I think in those terms. And now that the last album is out, like one year, I think already about the next one. I already have the name for it. I need ten to twelve pieces, seventy-four minutes, which is the CD. So I have those limitations, and I, I think much more in those terms. And in this frame, I'm of course loose, and I don't let myself push into smarter, uh, smaller pieces or longer, but um, it's, those, it's this mechanic of, of bringing out like, like a band, like the new Radiohead or the new Rammstein or whatever. And um, this is a, that's why communication with the fans and the people that listen to me is so important. And it's not just, I just like to be loved and try to write something that the people of it's communication it's like a you know nobody would say bob dylan is not a component it's not a componist and it's not a composer and it's not an artist he's in communication with his fans he knows exactly how to tell his things and with what chords to get his message to the people that listen to him and this is the same mechanics that i use not in the singer songwriter not in the electronic music in the, in the i just use orchestra instruments and try to get with what I like to tell to my people with a little bit of tension here and a little bit of give them a bit balance and hope there and so but it's it's a give and take and I get a lot back and I'm constantly in communication I get feedback through the social media which I use excessively and um, this is the music is just a tool to, to talk and to talk about so many more things we <laughs> so many more problems we have at the moment and that I can't even think of the way Stravinsky thought get an audience in a hundred years maybe because we don't have a hundred years so I hope you're all thinking about your next album that's the way forward um, I just wanted to make sure there's time for some questions I, I realize it's a little out of time And everybody can nowadays compose and takes a computer and everybody's doing so many things and also we have so many more art that, than Brahms had. In the times of Brahms you couldn't even go to a cinema because the art of cinematography was not invented. So it's so many more things that you, where you can find yourself and satisfy your soul. And, and it's exploding, every day is coming more. So 
find your audience and get in contact and get into communication and, and communicate. As I said, um, the, the, the vacuum is over. You can't, can, can't survive and it also doesn't make any sense anymore, I think, because it's too important to get people involved with the good ideas in order to have maybe a hundred years, which um, is also not possible if you just go back and have this old ideal of the artist being in the woods and doing, uh, being in conversation with himself. Um, I'm sorry, I uh, would like to emphasize the, the difference between uh, entertainment music, which goes directly to the public, and uh, cultural music. So uh, people are satisfied uh, in uh, entertainment music, but in our music, in cultural uh, music, they, they, are, they are seeking uh, sort of catharsis, sort of, of uh, being in a... In a, in a state uh, in a very high state of mind in the uh, in the sense of uh, of sublime sublime or uh, uh, sort of things so uh, so so if we seek the immediate uh, um, perception of the public we could uh, low down too much the <laughs> the level of the artist sometimes okay where is yeah. culture what is cultural music what is uh, I, I Yeah, but uh, what is entertainment? I don't know. If you have an audience, is entertainment? What is Avo Pert uh, Spiegel im Spiegel, mirror in the mirror? Is this is uh, is this entertainment? No, entertainment is um, pop music. So th this is what I'm talking about. Yeah, but I did not talk about pop music. No, no, no I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the relations, the relation with the public. Yeah. So uh, uh, we we don't need to have so much. Uh, <laughs> So much audience as in uh, popular music. Yeah, but, but yeah, this is not what I was saying. This is a misunderstanding. I, I did not talk about pop music. I talked about the wide field of, of high cultural art that is communicating with the outside. And uh, Miles Davis was an artist. It is not considered to be uh, popular music. It, it was an artist and a composer, but he was communicating with his crowd, with his with the black community, with the jazz fans, and with the, you know. I, I was saying not to expect so much audience, as in pop music. I don't, I didn't say uh, you were <laughs> talking about pop music. This was, of course, uh, we sh should uh, uh, be happy with the audience uh, we have when we are true. This is my... Francois, you look as though you want to jump in there. Sven, do you want to? We have no time, so but uh, just before we, we leave the discussion, I must say I don't agree at all about all you are saying, so I can't, it's not possible that I say uh, I agree with that. So my conception of the music is not a question of context, not a question of communication, and not a question of audience, you see, so, because for me the most important in music like in other domains, in the ideas, you see, the question of ideas. In music, you have ideas. In a piece of music, you have ideas or you have not. And the question of ideas is not a problem of context, not at all. In this point, I don't agree with the idea that uh, the context is separating modern and pre-modern. I think it's not true because it's a separation in the, uh, inside the modern between modern and contemporary art contemporary, you see, it's another question. But uh, there is no separation of modern art with classic art, I speak in music, for example, Schoenberg, Schoenberg is modern, and it's not a problem of context. So the eruption of the problem of the context is not separating classicism and modern, is uh, after the modern, you say postmodern or contemporary art, but in modern art or in modern music, it's not a problem of, of context, not at all. And a problem of ideas, ideas for humanity, is not a problem of context, it's not a problem of communication, because an idea is not to communicate, it's a way of thinking, and thinking is not exactly communication. And of course it's not a problem of audience, because the problem of audience is a problem of quantity, you see. Or we know that is, uh, one people, if one people or two people in all the humanity has something to think, new ideas, 
see in the mathematics, you see, for example, in mathematics, you have the big, uh, uh, for, uh, big, big doctor of, I take some example, Andre Veil. Andre Veil is the brother of Simon Veil. He was invented the new algebra. You see, when he write his doctoral on uh, mathematics, there was in all the world only three people who was able to read and understand what he, he writes. But 50, uh, 50 years after, it's another thing, you see? So, just, I don't agree at all. And so I think that we have a separation between us, okay, no problem, but there is no uh, agreement, all of people, on these kind of ideas, I don't agree. That's absolutely right as well. We're all so different, and I'm glad about that. <laughs> So we're going to leave it there. There's, there's not time for questions, I don't think, from the audience. But what I would say is maybe if the, the panelists are kind enough, if you have a burning question for them, do come up and speak to them afterwards. Um, I know there's people who have to go to some other events now. But I just want to thank everybody for a really what turned out to be an interesting debate and a, a enlightening for me. Thank you, guys. Thank you.